I'd like to introduce our last speaker tonight, Zhang Jung, who is the editor of Urban China, is a researcher, curator, writer, um, and designer. Um, and uh, at the end of a very long day, bear with us, you've been fantastically patient. Thanks, Zhang Jung, for, for not only hanging out for the whole day before he gives his presentation, but also agreeing to swap with the last panel because Beta had to go. Zhang Jung, thank you very much, and welcome to Social Housing, Housing the Social. It's my honor. Also, thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm indeed very sleepy, and um, it's a really horrible jet lag now, and thank you for sharing my jet lag. Um, basically, I want to set up a framework for the discussion of our topic by literally uh, um, dismantling social housing into the two, two words, housing and the social. And uh, I, I find uh, uh, the, the first word housing is actually what we as uh, architects are always working on. And uh, the word uh, social is what we have to give responses to. But uh, in the previous uh, years when I'm doing urban China, I have this uh, general framework to uh, analyze uh, how space uh, is generated. Uh, uh, in such a context, including economical and social, political, and culture. And uh, basically, we have this sequence because um, uh, our uh, human activities are always uh, generated from a certain uh, natural geography or natural space, and then we have a uh, specific economic, economic base, and then we have a social and political uh, organization of this economical activities, and finally, we have a different form of the cultures to, uh, from this kind of an organization. And however, I want to, uh, because of limitation of time, I want to focus uh, these four dimensions uh, of the context into uh, the economic mechanisms of social housing and the social organizations of housing and the political, uh, especially the policies on the land and the housing. And finally, the collectivity, which we also use just now, uh, of the uh, housing. I also want to set up uh, a, a dimension of time or history uh, in this uh, coordination. coordination. Uh, I uh, ma made a very general uh, uh, division of the history of China. Uh, since we are not so uh, familiar, I mean here, we are not so familiar with the, all the details of Chinese history. Basically, I classified Chinese history into three, uh, three models, including the agriculture China. Uh, which is actually a very uh, sustaining model in a pre-modern for many thousand years until uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution under the exter external force. And then there is uh, Industrial China, but here I admit it, uh, I admit it the uh, colonial time of China, which also includes uh, a, a hundred of years uh, Fourth industrialization, but here I'm talking about the industrialization uh, uh, after the uh, founding of the People's, uh, People's Republic of China uh, in 1950s. And then urban China, which is uh, actually a shift of the industrial China uh, in 1980s, uh, in which uh, the, the focus or target of the urbanization is uh, shifting from um, production center or production oriented to uh, consumption oriented. So we have this coordination. And firstly, I would like to talk about uh, the, the spatial form of agriculture China, which is uh, uh, you are very familiar with, the courtyard house. Uh, basically, the courtyard house is a uh, is is kind of form that uh, uh, a certain uh, public space, which is very in the world public space, is surrounded by all these uh, private houses, and uh, this is very typical pre-modern Chinese uh, topology, um, in which you can find everywhere in Asian Chinese cities. And this is also very fractal uh, from architecture to city to the whole country, uh, in which uh, the space of the different scales of, uh, of regimes are always surrounded by walls, which shows uh, this system 
of uh, organization is quite uh, inward. And uh, the whole uh, discipline or, or the whole organization of the space is uh, set up by uh, a very long, uh, a very ancient Bible called the uh, Classics of Rights, in which everybody respects. And uh, this classic right is actually a Bible or kind of classic of uh, Confucianism. And uh, it's actually uh, not written by uh, urban planner, but it's, it's written by philosopher. However, it works as a, a, a principle of urban planner and everybody obey, obey with it. And finally, the whole space is uh, either the, the, the scale of country, the scale of city, the scale of such a house is uh, coordinated according to this principle. So uh, you can imagine this is a very flexible system and uh, this system sometimes works in the house into a very big scale. Here I show you a picture of a big courtyard house in Shanxi province, uh, which the, the scale of which uh, moves up to over 32,000 uh, square meters, which is actually the scale of a small town and the transportation uh, inside this small, uh, this big uh, courtyard house is, uh, is uh, actually carried out by horses. And then uh, the economic uh, mecha mechanism of courtyard house is always uh, self-driven or uh, what we use today very frequently, self-organization. And uh, this is also a very typical uh, way of organization in agricultural society uh, in, in which uh, we always describe agriculture as a self-sufficiency. And the house is, uh, is actually a, a part of this agriculture self-sufficiency or self-organization. And the social organization of the courtyard house is always uh, run by family or clan in which every member of this uh, housing is uh, actually a member of the family. And uh, the land policy at that time is, uh, is private owned. <clears throat> And then because of this system, uh, the collectivity uh, of this housing is quite uh, virtually, uh, vertically uh, organized, uh, in which a typical house like uh, this uh, big courtyard sometimes uh, reach, uh, reach up to thousands. And this uh, family, this is actually an anonymous family which, uh, which reach up to 300 family members. And this is a way how the ancient uh, local people, or local society members actually organize themselves in a vertical way in which uh, the center of the authority is always in the, in their ancestor and they always set up an ancestor temple in the, in the, in the center of the house so that they can uh, bind up together as a whole and uh, they can uh, be more uh, competitive in the uh, uh, in the struggle between the local societies or the between, even between the society and the state. I, I, I can give a name to this kind of uh, housing system that uh, it can be called um, uh, metabolism housing because it's really similar to the uh, post-war post movement in Japan in which the city can be very flexible uh, uh, along with the uh, growth or the change of the population. And the house like this, uh, very flexible organized, that has this kind of flexibility. Uh, when the members of the family is growing bigger and then they have more courtyard and houses when it's growing smaller and they just dismantle it. <clears throat> And the uh, second phase of this is, uh, is called industrial China. But here I want to show a picture of agriculture China first to show this is a vertical system of a collectivity. Uh, and then in 1950s, there's a, a big land reform in China, which is called uh, Tugai. It's called land reform, literally. And uh, in which many, uh, almost all the landlords uh, from the agriculture China are collectively criticized by the peasants, especially poor peasants, under the uh, guidance and or coordination of the Communist Party of China. And then uh, the whole social organization is shifted to another uh, horizontal form. 
uh, you can see a very similar uh, kind of similar uh, picture from this one to this one. However, uh, in this picture, all the members of this uh, family is not uh, anymore, uh, how to say, uh, related in blood. They're just uh, comrades or colleagues. However, it is still called the family of the society because finally they are related by their social classes. They are all, how to say, a working class or peasants. So this is a new form, and uh, this form is 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 uh, is more or less is more like a horizontal form. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the political lens land system is also changed uh, in the form of revolution, and this is also you can say you can compare this to the Occupy Wall Street at this time because at that time a few land laws is occupying a. Uh, a great amount of land or property uh, in a country, uh, and then the, that is the reason or that is the impetus of Communist Party to mobilize the uh, huge number of poor peasants to, um, uh, to do this kind of revolution against this uh, private-owned system. However, uh, there is a very short time that the land is really uh, literally owned by the peasants, and then up to uh, two or three years, uh, it is shifted to the so-called public system. But the public system here will have two parts. One part is called the state-owned uh, land system. Another is the collective-owned land system. And state-owned state land is, uh, basically means the urban land, and the collective land is rural land. And this is the way uh, how China is industrial realize itself um, by uh, classifying the whole territory into urban and rural, and there's a serious difference between the two territories, and so that uh, the accumulation of the capital can be uh, taken from the exploitation of the rural countryside. And this is uh, a kind of cruel, very brutal way of uh, accumulation of capital, but is somehow uh, maybe the only option at that time because uh, we don't have any choices in colonization or any choices in launching wars against other countries. So uh, basically this is also a self-circulated or self-sufficient way uh, in 1950s. And uh, uh, this kind of house is called Danwei House. Let's translate Danwei. Danwei is actually a military term from the war, war time. It's, it's actually a, a unit of a military army, but this term was inherited after the, uh, after the war. And uh, Danwei House is actually a, a main form of uh, the uh, post-war China. Uh, this is a map of the agricultural Beijing, agriculture uh, Beijing in agriculture time in China. But you can see all these characters here, the letter is very small, but every uh, title here is actually the name of a department or, or, or a ministry. So basically the whole um, uh, um, imperial, imperial capital city of China is now occupied by the new regime, the unit of a new, new regime. And because of this reason, the ancient uh, cultural heritage is uh, reoccupied and surrounded by the new regime. And somehow, uh, this new system actually uh, can give very little compromise to the old space, and that is why uh, uh, it's very uh, impossible later for Beijing to avoid the demolition of the old spaces. And then we can see the picture here uh, that the courtyard house from agriculture China is re-renovated uh, into a lot of uh, small spaces. Uh, you can see here, this house is, uh, uh, the roof is kind of curved, so this roof is more ancient. However, this, uh, for example, this roof is quite straight, and this is uh, very obviously is constructed later. So the big courtyard house, uh, the feudal courtyard house is uh, re-divided uh, for different families. Originally, one house is for one family, and now maybe for eight families. And, uh, and then this, the whole system is also, um, uh, is also uh, managed under the mechanism of a plan system, and everybody is given a house, uh, which is a big part of a socialism as a social welfare system. And we, you can also say this is a kind of a physical form of salary, 
uh, uh, being given to the workers and peasants, and uh, the uh, how to say the real salary is very low, but the basic uh, social welfare or social security is guaranteed: education, housing, or hospitality, and uh, other social welfares actually are uh, kept in a very low level, but still going down uh, well uh, in uh, at that time. And uh, the social organization is called Danway. So Danway is, is the uh, continuation of this military form, but uh, Danway is also something different from what, what you can see in Russia, in Soviet Union at that time. Soviet Union is much more centralized, and uh, Moscow is playing a big role in this playing system, but Danway here in China actually means a local or uh, social uh, self-organization other than the uh, command from, from Beijing. So it's actually a dual system. One is a state, another society. But this uh, uh, so social organization is also quite centered inside itself. So for example, if you want to get married, you have to send a report to your down way to get uh, permission. And the uh, political land policy here is still the public state-owned uh, state land and the collective-owned land, one in the city, another in, uh, in, in the countryside. And then outside the Asian city of Beijing, uh, you can see uh, the new towns. The new towns are actually a uh, copy. Uh, we learned a lot from Soviet Union. So uh, uh, this is a copy from the Soviet uh, experiment in a new town called Micro Region. And Micro Region translated into uh, Micro City, which means that uh, this small town is actually uh, quite self-sufficient inside itself. They have uh, not only houses, social welfare houses for the, for the workers uh, or the members of the unit, but they also have the public spaces or the social services and uh, some basic social uh, facilities. And, uh, and this system is also a plan and is also a very important part of Danway. And you can see this is a, a very typical um, uh, uh, house from uh, uh, Danway, and you can access the community through this wall. Because this is, uh, um, um, in many cases, this is run by the Danway. And if this is a big Danway, and uh, if uh, the, the number of workers in the Danway are a huge number, and then uh, sometimes this community can be huge to accommodate hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, so this is also uh, somehow different from the current model of the uh, uh, market-driven uh, real estate uh, development. <clears throat> And then uh, into the 1980s, uh, the whole collective spaces, collective spaces in Danway is uh, privatized. Uh, I mean, privatized here means the usage, the use of the uh, spaces are privatized. And then there are many changes. Uh, here's, here is one example to show how the uh, collective, collective space inside Danway inside this Danway house is changed into a uh, kind of diversified, um, privatized uh, facilities. So previously inside this house, uh, uh, this house uh, in many houses, they have uh, individual dormitories and they have uh, individual toilets sometimes, but in most of the cases they have public toilets. And in most of the cases, they don't have the kitchens because kitchen is supposed to be some, something illegal. So they have uh, public dining halls. And, uh, and then in the 1980s, this kind of uh, public dining hall is totally abandoned. And uh, the public washing rooms, uh, because the water is not uh, public uh, welfare or public services, now it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not privatized, but you have to pay for the water. So in, a, in order to prevent somebody else inside this house who used to be your colleague uh, stealing water from your house, your uh, bibcock, you have to lock uh, this bibcock. So uh, the landscape of this uh, small infrastructure is quite diversifiedly uh, uh, segmentized into different segments uh, like this. And then let's go to the uh, agriculture China in the industrial time of China. Uh, here is uh, another example to show the uh, social housing in uh, uh, rural China in, in uh, 1950s, 1960s. 
And this is a paradigm, uh, paradigm village in China called Dazai. Because this village uh, is constructed on the slope of a mountain, I chose another example of the agriculture uh, house, agriculture uh, uh, courtyard house from the same area, also from Shanxi province. You can see uh, the house here also terraced uh, into different terraces. However, uh, this house is, uh, the courtyard is quite connected. And uh, this house, the whole courtyard is actually divided into different families for, for individual use. And you can say this is a privatized system inside a, a public, family-based public spaces. So there is a very interesting hierarchy uh, inside this house. However, inside this house, you can see there's an interesting crossroad of the public spaces and the private spaces. So here, you can see all the kitchens along this row and all the bedrooms and living room around this row. So the ground floor of this row is um, uh, on the opposite side of the uh, second floor of this row. And then if we want to do some cooking, you have to go across the, the, the public corridor to another side. And then for example here, I can show you a better example to show this, uh, public, how this public life is taking place. This is a public corridor, but uh, here is the kitchen, here is the, is the living room, a bedroom. So actually you have to go across every day, and then your neighborhood is also going across like this every day. And finally, there is an interesting crossroad. And this is uh, uh, interesting, uh, for me, it's interesting crossroad between the vertical uh, system and the horizontal system inside the design of the space. <clears throat> and uh, the change between this model to this model is actually the change uh, from the uh, vertical organization of family members to the horizontal organization of the uh, social classes. <clears throat> so let's go to urban China. Uh, originally, in 1949, the urbanization rate of China is very low, and uh, five minutes? I cannot believe it. I have 45 minutes, actually. Now it's only 20 minutes. <laughs> huh? Oh, wow. It's almost in mission impossible. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'll try. Okay, let's skip. And uh, I want to say... <laughs> I want to say, uh, yeah, 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 I, I just, uh, yeah, accelerate. Uh, the urbanization after the liberation of China, I mean, after the founding of the uh, People's, People's Republic of China, uh, in the first 30 years is mostly uh, production oriented. So this map actually shows the, uh, the number of the new cities are mostly industrial cities. And in the 1960s, uh, this new city is actually moving hinterland. However, uh, in, uh, yeah, this, <laughs> okay. In, 19, 19, in 1980s, uh, there is a, a very important reform in China, which is called marketization. And then this, uh, this title is legalized later into the uh, market economy with Chinese characteristics or socialism market economy. So uh, within a few years, this urbanization rate has, uh, Oh, okay. Well, it's too fast now. Uh, a few years, this urbanization rate actually has uh, reached up to over uh, almost 50% uh, in, in another 30 years. Okay, let's move. <clears throat> And then the, uh, one of the big change uh, in, uh, after the 1980s is that uh, the system introduced the idea of a private or private, uh, privatization. But this privatization is actually limited into a certain uh, forms of right. So uh, basically the right of the land or property of the land, uh, ownership of the land is still state-owned or collective owned but the right of this property is actually is split into a cluster of rights. So the usage is kind of them, and uh, the transfer is kind of them. 
the right of uh, the distribution of the benefit is also one of them, and so, and so on and so forth. And then actually, in this way, uh, the system can manage um, uh, reform in a very gradual way. So uh, it's very dif uh, different from the shock therapy in, in Russia, in Soviet Union, late, late Soviet Union and in Russia. And in this way, uh, actually, um, uh, the system can combine the efficiency of the centralization or plan system with the efficiency of the market system. So basically, you can have a double failure. Uh, in, in, for example, in the late uh, 1980s in Soviet Union, that uh, both the plan system doesn't work, but the market system also is very disastrous. But actually, the case in China somehow shows the possibility that the, the, the two systems can combine to each other. However, they have to focus on in different places. Even in the macro scale of the economy of the system, it should be public. Uh, so for example, energy, the food supply, and so on and so forth should be public. But the problem with the United States, for me, is actually the many basic needs and uh, some, some strategic uh, area like uh, weapon making is privatized and uh, food supply is privatized, energy is privatized. And, and the whole country is kind of kidnapped by some uh, individual billionaires, so that is very uh, risky for, for China. And uh, the micro um, area of this economy is privatized, that's, that's okay. So there is kind of interesting tension between the state economy and the social economy, and which creates this kind of interaction between the state and society. So uh, through this uh, privatization, I would like to talk about the transformation from agriculture China to urban China. So, one of the uh, uh, consequences of this urbanization is, uh, and, uh, is the urban village like this. And uh, this urban village is actually uh, 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 what, what I call a dividend, a dividend of the collective land or dividend of the collective land system. Uh, because uh, within the urbanization of this, uh, within the sprawl of the city, the city can uh, take away uh, the arable land uh, of the village according to the master plan. So master plan is work as a law here, but the city can not easily take away the uh, living land or residen re residential land of the constructed villages. And this constructed village is actually the basic minimum uh, social welfare for these villagers inside, already inside the city. And somehow this village uh, become um, a kind of informal supply uh, of social housing for the uh, uh, poorer uh, immigrants of the city. Uh, especially those peasants from hinterland. So here is a place uh, where two kind of people meet. They are both peasant, but one kind of person is rich, much, much richer, and sometimes a millionaire, and another kind of peasant is very, very poor uh, from hinterland. So poor, poor people from hinterland meeting the richer peasant in the coastline. And I, I think this kind of... Uh, uh, um, uh, informal supply of the social housing is actually a consumption for the absence of the, uh, the role of a gov a government in, in providing the social housing in China in the previous 30 years. And then here I, I, I'm showing a, a house, a typical house that is transformed from the courtyard house of agriculture China into urban China. Because of this uh, uh, this new opportunity, uh, the original agricultural courtyard house is not, uh, d uh, doesn't provide enough FAR, the pro, uh, flow area ratio. And then every house start to uh, accum accumulate themselves into skyscrapers, of course, in an informal way. So here I, I actually dom documented a house that is really a very rural metropolitan architecture. Uh, from the ground floor, the ground floor is really like a shopping mall. Uh, it's a small uh, vendor uh, spaces. Second floor is a warehouse. And third place is, is a, a painting house because this village is uh, devoting to the fake uh, oil, oil painting, including Van Gogh and so on and so forth. And the classroom and the school uh, for, uh, for the training of the, of the workers and the living room and the bedroom of the bosses. And uh, also there's a laundry uh, platform on the roof. And so this is one typical case to show the topology of uh, the agriculture China houses. The courtyard houses is transforming into a house without courtyard. However, you can also say the courtyard now is come up here, but the, the whole, 
composition of all the floors is really at, uh, very, very um, pragmatical, very practical um, uh, for the needs. And uh, because of this uh, practical opportunity, they become very metropolitan also. <clears throat> And, uh, and another uh, um, special problem I want to talk about is uh, what's happening in China. In the hinterland China is that so many uh, uh, overdue laborers are leaving the villages, and then the, 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 many of the villages are becoming empty. Uh, so many people talk about this, uh, empty villages, but I would like to talk about uh, a hidden problem here, is that uh, basically, if the uh, peasants are migrating into the cities, they are occupying the constructed urban area, which uh, in many cases means social housing, either social housing provided by the factory or by the unit or by the company or the rented by themselves or bought by themselves. So urban constructed area. And, uh, and then actually they also has a piece of land in the countryside and this piece of land are collective owned. And so they, have, they are part of this collectivity. However, when the village are empty, so the usage of this collective house is quite insufficient. And then you can imagine, this is really like a case I find in Moscow or in Russia, that every Russian people has a, another second house uh, in, in a suburb. And then you have an urban area here, but everybody has a small house here. And then you have an interesting uh, doubled, doubled city. The city is like this, and however, there is another city like this. So you can only leave 50% of each, and then the whole city is also insufficiently used. So uh, this is also uh, another problem in China, and this is problem is actually created by the in inability that uh, the government uh, cannot manage uh, yet uh, that uh, if they can give enough social welfare to the immigrants or uh, peasants from the countryside to the city because they do not want to see something like this, uh, which, is, which, which means slum. The collective owned land in the countryside means that when the peasant got really frustrated, lost, lost their, jobs, uh, their jobs and um, any kind of frustration, they can go back to the countryside and become a peasant again. But if they have any opportunity, they can be a non-peasant doing some kind of non-agriculture in the city. So this is kind of flexible uh, move in between the hinterland and the coastline. So collective owned land, the system actually provides this kind of a slum, almost slum-free uh, phenomena in China. <clears throat> And then I, uh, here I want to talk about the transformation from industrial China to urban China. And uh, this, uh, uh, this is uh, one of the micro-region, Chinese version micro-region uh, house in, uh, in, in uh, Beijing city. However, uh, when the whole city become urbanized and uh, when more and more people are moving in the city, uh, especially after the commercialization of the housing system in 1989 in China, the different positions of the city, uh, especially uh, the locations very close to the center of the city, become super expensive. And at that time, most of the micro-region, the so-called big courtyard, socialism big courtyard, downway house, are located in such locations. And then there's uh, uh, another dilemma here inside the big metropolitan cities like Beijing, Shanghai. Uh, the residents who used to be very, you know, not so poor, but uh, of course not so rich, uh, when they have a house here and after the reform of the house, they can buy the house in, with a very, very cheap price, like 500 RMB for one square meter is really cheap. But now they can sell the house for... 20,000 RMB for square meters. So they become really benefited and they become uh, millionaires. However, uh, theoretically, this kind of increment of the land, um, of the location, should be shared by the whole society. And then the, uh, this increment should be reinvested into the social welfare, including social housing. But this doesn't work in China so far. So I, I feel that is a huge problem. And another uh, uh, contradiction is that um, although those people have become uh, millionaires because, it's, because of this uh, incre increment of the land value, they do not invest in uh, any single cent into their public spaces, the original public space. It's really like a, a, sh a shrinkage of the social surface inside all these houses. So uh, they moved out to better places, but these places start to decay. Yeah like this. 
And then finally, uh, for urban China, the, uh, so far the most uh, frequently discussed issue is that uh, the urban China is based too much on land finance because so many people were discussing it. Uh, I, I'm going to just give a few sentences. Uh, basically, it means that the local government uh, has very little uh, channels of income and uh, the the best in, uh, channel of income is by selling or leasing the land uh, to the developers uh, for 50 to 70 years. And then uh, the land finance actually occupy over 30% of most of the local governments. And then the local government actually become very, very uh, mobilized to grab the land from everywhere, and especially from the better locations. So there are a lot of conflicts you can imagine in China between the local government developers and the local Local residents. So here is an example to show the extreme case in, in Chongqing, uh, where inside this house there are there are a husband and wife, and the wife is a lawyer, so he can she can literally fight with the uh, with other people, and the husband is actually a kung fu player, so he can physically fight with the lawyer. But finally, the developer actually did something like this and make a big groove, uh, and finally the house become really a very isolated island inside over there. But the demonstration is still going now, you can see. Uh, it is, this is called a Nair household. However, I, uh, uh, another huge problem is that because the land finance are so uh, dominating, uh, the, uh, uh, the impetus of the local government in developing affordable housing or cheap renting housing is really, really low. So here is an index to show uh, how the percentage of the uh, uh, investment and the constructed area of the affordable or cheap renting houses in China is really shrinking. Um, in, in 2000, it used to reach up to 26%, but now it's almost like 6%. It's really amazing for such a big country to have such a low percentage of social housing. So, uh, uh, now uh, 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 the government, after the government act, uh, uh, the government ever since 2003, they used to prepare for this kind of control on the, uh, on the housing prices. However, in 2003, there is a big event called SARS, and SARS is actually a big impact on economy. And and then uh, the government found okay, real estate development, especially commercial commercialized housing, uh, real estate is really uh, pushing the economy. And so the GDP uh, in, in increment rate in 2003 is around uh, 9.1, which is incredible in such a uh, crisis moment. And, uh, and then actually from 2003, the price, the price of the housing in China is really like a, a rocket until 2009. And 2009, the government started to control, but there is another crisis coming up, you know, the credit crisis from the United States. And then the government launched a lot of financial um, um, uh, investment, uh, around $3 trillion. Uh, no, four trillion into uh, uh, into the economy, and finally the price is still going high. So uh, China is one of the countries still have this tradition of a plan economy, but now China is uh, translating this word uh, plan into planning uh, to highlight the role of the dynamic planning, which means that the plan is actually shifting with the change of the world. So uh, the recent launch the planning from early this year is called 12 Five Year Planning, and in which uh, the government decided to construct uh, 30, 30 million households for I mean 30 million households. Yeah. So if every household is for four people, which is going to cover like 100 million, and 100 million is actually going to cover all the immigrants in the coming five years, and this is five-year plan. So it's a very typical Chinese way, but I hope it's going to be realized. And then in Chongqing, one of the uh, new socialism cities in China, uh, the government set up the, a very detailed planning in, uh, in controlling the whole real estate market. So for the high-end real estate market, uh, they started to launch the uh, property revenue, property tax. So this is uh, going to limit or restrict the development of this high expensive uh, real estate development, especially those villas. 
And then for the mid-level uh, market, yes, uh, give it to the market. Yeah. So, but they set up uh, criteria. Uh, for example, this 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 house, the price of the house is not going to uh, exceed the uh, six times of the annual income, something like that. And then the, for the lower end market, the the government is going to guarantee the security of the housing supply. So the, uh, the government is, is construct a lot of social housing for, for this market. So this is a very systematic uh, division of the whole, the whole system of the housing supply. And then and another planning is more like national planning. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the previous 30 years, most of the urbanization uh, took place uh, along the coastline of China, but now, uh, uh, China has the ability to mobilize the whole resources of the uh, of the state uh, by means of the centralized plan, plan system, planning system. So now, huge amount of investment goes to the hinterland, especially goes to the uh, uh, the northwest. So the focus or uh, the next focus is going to shift to the hinterland. Finally, there's a more balanced com complementary structure uh, of the whole country, which means that the pressure of the metropolitan city on the coastline is going to be uh, relatively released. Uh, this is really like uh, the theory in urban planning, in which if you have a multi-centered city, and uh, the price of this, the, the price will be lower than a single-centered city. So this is actually a multi-centered country, which is much much lower. The price could be lower in the same single-centered country, like, just like Russia. Russia is really concentrating in Moscow and Saint Petersburg. <clears throat> And uh, finally, I would like to talk about the social organization here. Uh, here, uh, is the, what is the new form of the organization, social organization in this new urbanized China? It's called client community, but it's very weird uh, termination, I know. But uh, what I find interesting is that uh, there is a huge potential inside this uh, cli client community because China has a, a very little tradition of democracy, as everybody knows. And everybody, uh, everybody wants to be democratic, however, finally become very violent. So uh, I cannot imagine China has uh, occupying uh, Wall Street like that, and finally it's, it's not going to be very violent. So uh, the, there is a new situation that uh, these people, especially middle class people uh, living in this new client community, they pay a lot, sometimes uh, millions of money for the property, and they have some ownership over there. They are very responsible for, for their community because they are responsible for their property. And then there is a very interesting micro politics here. Uh, the clients, actually, they can have a client's committee. Uh, in some kind of communities, they are, uh, they are, uh, yeah, they are, this kind of community is generating now. And, uh, and then they can uh, send the delegates to form a standing committee of clients uh, who is actually really like the, uh, how to say, the parliament, parliament, parliament of the, of the community. And then they are going to uh, talk or hire, uh, hire a good government for themselves, which is a community management office and to maintain the services. And then this is really the model of the serving the people, as Chairman Mao used to say, serving the people. However, this, this model is really like a democ democratic model and a bottom-up model. And then the, according to one of the uh, very famous scholars in China, he said this kind of a client community could be a, a, a potential cradle for democracy of China, because when people get trained or get experience in such this micro-democracy model, they can go up to the uh, middle scale and top scale, and finally, they can be responsible to the country. So this is one of the interesting things that take place in the housing, uh, housing movement now in China. However, the, what is the spatial topology of the housing? I am going to give two cases. One case is about a very global uh, situation, uh, uh, which is called gated community. In China, it's also like this, but uh, there's one case here. Uh, the ambition of this project is to de dissolve uh, the uh, uh, enclosure of the gated uh, community by extending the interface between the insider and the outsiders very, very long. So here, you can see three museums. Uh, one museum is outside, another inside courtyard, and finally, another museum here, designed by Omar, is situated on the top of the building. 
And then uh, the three museums actually connect to each other. However, the outsiders can access the whole uh, the, uh, routine of the museum, one, two, three. However, they are not, uh, they are not really uh, get accessed into the, this house, so it's still gated. But this gated is, is actually changing from this to this, so I, I hope you can understand. So uh, you, you can see how boring this community could be, but because of this museum, actually it changed a lot. Uh, but I also want to say uh, the developer in China is very, very um, different from uh, other developers. You can see all the incredibly uh, impressive or conceptual or sometimes really ridiculous termination of the real estate development in China because one thing because China is getting rich. Another thing is that China want to get a culture identity when they're getting rich. So there is a competition between the residents, uh, which kind of concept is better. So some developers actually involving the, themselves into these public spaces in a top-down way. And they are not, going, they are not only providing public, uh, public arts, but they are providing platform for public, public art like, like this. So this is one of the developers. Another case is uh, how the ancient topology of a courtyard house like this is um, reinterpreted into something like this. And uh, this is a, a recent design by urbaners in, in China. You can see a similar topology, but I have to say the real organization inside the house is totally changed from vertical to horizontal. So the original house, uh, the original house is really centered uh, by an ancestral temple here, uh, and the whole house is one family and one village, village and uh, uh, the same family name, but here they are actually the same social class, which is like uh, a poorer class They're living together, so it's quite different. So my question is that, so what kind of new collectivity or public uh, activities could be take place inside the center of this house? And uh, finally, this is real finally, uh, I promise, yeah. <laughs> so we used to have different collectivities. Uh, one, uh, the first collectivism is actually about the vertical collectivism, which means the relationship between the re relatives. Another in the industrial China is means the comrades. You can see the diversity of all the people, but they are belonging to the same class, the social stratum. And then what is the new collectivity here? I, I have some pictures to show the potential. Here you can see in, inside this new house, the people are living together, uh, together with several different generations. Three generations living together. So this is actually a kind of uh, uh, a revival of the Asian the vertical relatives, uh, relatives to collectivism. Another mode is that still like nuclear family is that the, the typical uh, nuclear family with one child policy and a one child policy is living together. And uh, so we have to imagine what is, how they are going to manage their relationship with their parents. And uh, here you can see some, uh, some workers, it's kind of migrant workers living together in uh, very cheap houses here. And this is somehow reminders of this model. And somehow this guy is living very individually, but he's a painter, so he's going to uh, collaborate with some of his artist friends. And finally, is there going to be an artistic community uh, in this uh, house or community? And finally, this guy is, is, uh, is uh, surfing in the internet, so is he going to introduce uh, the offline or online uh, social relationship, social network into the offline? So all these potentials actually works together in China now. All this scenario is possible. But uh, according to a recent planning in uh, one of the cities of China, they are going to make this into a principle to mix the different uh, social organizations, different uh, social classes into a piece of land. And uh, you have higher house, middle house, and very cheap houses, so that all the different social classes can share the public space, share uh, the social facilities into a so-called harmonious uh, society. So I hope that can become true. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi. Um, 
John Jung, thank you. Come and sit down. Thank you for an incredible, I mean, it, that was an incredible presentation, um, not because of the amounts that you've packed into it and the amount of information we received from it, um, you know, trying to take it in at a late stage after so much conversation across the, um, across the whole day. Um, we, dinner is going to be served at 8.30, so we do have five minutes to talk to Zhang Zhan about that, and I think that given that there's so much information that he's given to us, I think that it would be important to open up for a couple of questions at the moment. And, and I had one to start with, which was a question about these new, this new concept of a client community. Um, which sounds like a very kind of neoliberal idea from a Western perspective, that actually the power of decision-making is placed within a, the concept of a client, a client being somebody who can buy something, so effectively buys political power. And yet in your narrative, you seem to, th you seem to suggest that there was actually... Thanks, Lara. Uh, you seem to suggest that there, there actually... You, you thought there was something quite interesting politically about this. I wonder if you could expand on that. Um, basically, China has a very horrible history, as you know, for 150 years. The revolution on modernism and the recent disaster, including Cultural Revolution, in which Mao want to give democracy to the people, and uh, the Tiananmen event, which is very sensitive in China, is also one of them, in which the students were uh, very democratically uh, standing on the square for, for almost two months, but uh, finally there is a tragedy. But all this actually shows the frustrations in uh, democratizing the, the country. So uh, the, the potential of this uh, client community is, is that uh, they are somehow more like uh, reform uh, led by some, some, somebody who are more responsible and more, uh, I cannot say more educated, but they are, in average, they are very educated and uh, more rational compared to, for example, some never educated peasants who only care about what he himself think about. Here, people have to think collectively, at least inside this uh, micro community. So there are some uh, uh, criteria here. And, uh, uh, another another potential is that uh, this, if this is an experiment, this experiment only takes place in a certain laboratory, which is a community. So uh, if there is a very bad uh, consequence, it still can be controlled. So that is always the uh, situation in China, because we have suffered so much. And I always want to ask our, our American friend today, who is very... Uh, exciting, given very exciting lecture. What all these American was doing before the crisis? So now it's already 99 percent of people suffering from 91 uh, 1 percent. So, so I, I really wondered uh, how this process goes such, to such an extreme, because uh, uh, Chinese, in Chinese philosophy, we always believe in that we have to get the preparation for the future disasters. At least you have to set up a bottom line, right? Yeah. Bottom line, not go such extreme end. So. I think uh, to keep uh, the experiment, either you e expect this is good or uh, like utopian idea, yeah. just keep it in the small scale, and then when it's really successful, successful, you can promote it into other places. So this has already happened in Shenzhen or other special zones in the coastline. So I think this is com compared, right? Okay, and that's actually very interesting in relationship to a lot of the discussions we've been having today as a kind of pragmatic model of, of a, 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 a kind of client collectivity, in a sense. I mean, it, it sounds neoliberal, but it also sounds pragmatic, and maybe that's something that's been hovering underneath all of our discussions today, not just about China. Has anybody else got a comment or a question? Or you're too starving and we need to get some food? Yes, Tati. Hi, I, I just wanted to... Um, make the connection with some of the stuff we heard earlier today, this morning, the tent city, and also there was this example about Singapore that came up earlier. You showed the, the, the visual where you had that gated community, which was clearly sort of an elitist uh, um, condo type gated community. I wonder if you could reflect back on what Don Mitchell said this morning about um, actually perhaps this uh, elite gated community, would that be 
sort of the future banlieue or neighborhood project for China, sort of 25, 35 years from now? Uh, can, you, can you ask the question more clearly? Is that how can I uh, connect the condo type to the tent? Yes, uh, because the, so it's, 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 the, it's the gating and sort of the autonomy, uh, optimized unit. Um, in urban China, vis-a-vis -vis what we see in, in the US with these 10 cities. I just wonder if you wanted to reflect upon that. Yeah, uh, we don't have 10 cities in China. <laughs> yeah. uh, we don't have slum. We have very little slum, I have to say. Yeah, because uh, anyway, on one hand, people still have somewhere to withdraw if they are uh, frustrated. But in the United States, the problem is that if you lose your job, you, people get so nervous. Uh, in my childhood, when I watching the Hollywood movies, I, I couldn't understand why people are getting so nervous when they're losing their jobs. jobs. And in Russia, it's also like this. Uh, one Russian people uh, used to ask uh, uh, Britain, uh, British people, he said, wow, you, you are so frustrated, but you don't have a dacha? Dacha is some, somewhere they can withdraw, and they can plant some food, you know? They plant some food, and then they can have a minimum thing. But the United States, if you lose this job, you lose everything. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, it's really incredible. And uh, in China, you can go back to your land or you go back to your family. You can live in your parents. Yeah. And then finally, if you have no land, you have no family, and then you can go to the government. I think government still provides something. There's a minimum, also minimum provider. So I cannot compare because you, everybody of you can give me any case of Chinese slums. I don't have that case. Roman. Uh, sorry, Roman Vassa. Um, there just there seemed to be something in your talk that um, half of which talked about a traditional uh, typography of, um, of building types or architectural types, but then uh, uh, also talking about a long-term or long-running experiment. I'm just sort of interested. This isn't a very well-formed question. It's more of a thought. But uh, this idea of living perpetually in an experiment. Um, and whether in actual fact uh, do you then, when do you perceive it as an experiment, when do you perceive it as living? Um, and it just seems a very interesting phenomenon in relation perhaps to new towns as well, is that in fact you do just constantly live in an experiment. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered if you had any kind of views about that. Or whether there is a conversation in China about um, living in a constant experiment, because it seems that, you know, pre-1998, so yeah. experience of living in an experiment, then post-19, particularly within Shenzhen and places like that, you are constantly within an experiment. Uh, it's very officially listed into the files of a government. They, also, they always call it a trial or a yeah. test or yeah. experiment, yeah. and they give uh, not a law. It's not, uh, not like a constitution, it's like a law. It's just a piece of paper uh, stamped with the governmental stamps, and it said, okay, you can do this or you cannot do this. So it's always listening to the archive of the government. And you have, to, uh, you have to believe that Chinese government is very careful in the self-organization and then any other country that does. Uh, because in 1950s, this self-organization uh, is already systematically uh, demolished from the labor union to the peasant union, the student union. Mm. And they all exist, but the leadership of these unions, all these unions are actually are very connected to communist Party. So, uh, it's, it's very different from other countries. So if there is a, this kind of client, client committee, mm -hmm. they, they will be sensitive and they will be censored anyway. However, uh, I have some friends who are doing this. So for example, if one, if one committee is doing any kind of, for, for example, political thing, yeah, yeah but I, I, don't, I don't have any example how political it could be. But it would be very sensitive and it's actually very impossible to realize. But if it is a political thing, political uh, demonstration against, for example, the very bad management from the developer, and it can be, it's, it's going on. And then also, it also happened in the rural, rural side. If uh, this is really about politically against the government, okay, it's censored. However, it is, if this is really about uh, our prevent our uh, our right by increasing the economic output of the land. Okay, it's gone. So uh, politics are also are always very uh, very sensitive. But we uh, I used to work in media, so 
I'm, I'm, I personally am very interested in where is the borderline of the censorship. And sometimes you can go on around and realize your ambition by, by going around. And somehow I fear this is more positive than going directly to the target. We are going around and you become more objective sometimes. Yeah. Okay. So it's not tactics, it's strategy to reverse Arnold's previous anti deserto kind of thing. Um, I'm going to thank you very much and unfortunately, well not unfortunately because I guess we're all starving. We're going to go and have something to eat now. Zhang Zhang, thank you very much. It was